muy buenas tardes. Hello, buenos días. good afternoon, good morning. I hope you are all well and uh, we are and very happy with this cause. As Paula said, we have a very new things, including the first is that we're going to be for the first time with an IPv6 only course. This course is already quite frequent. As a matter of fact, for, we have given these courses for several courses, uh, basic IPv6, uh, advanced IPv6, and now we will discuss IPv6 only. For instance, we are going to give NAT64 with uh, DNS64, that's my part, and then Wesley is going to be addressing 464X LAT networks. That is also very important. And we know that um, 464 is um, uh, already in fashion. It's uh, broadly used by many internet providers across the world. And finally, Jose Gregorio Coutua will offer a course on CTP because um, we believe that the data centers that will be IPv6 only will already be, well, the present, but the future too. And we hope that there will be big deployment of IPv6 only IP, uh, data centers. And um, so the part of Wesley and mine, the people, the, the people that are worried about saving IPv4 addresses, well, this is the course for you precisely. So now let's start uh, with uh, our topic. So I'm going to speak of NAT64, DNS64, and please, I ask you to please pay attention to my part, basically, because much of what I'm going to say will somehow be linked to the subsequent parts. So if you understand, for instance, uh, NAT64 translation and the concepts on DNS64, whatever my colleagues will say will no doubt be very, very useful and you'll understand it better. As Paula said, please feel free to ask any questions you may wish in the Q&A feature. And my colleagues, Wesley and uh, Jose Gregorio Coutua will be paying close attention to the question. So let's go on here. First, the concepts. It's very important for us to understand what NAT64 is and what DNS64 is. NAT, and I, I'm sure that you will handle it as a concept. NAT64 speaks of well, taking an IPv6 package and uh, translate it into uh, IPv4 and the other way around. So we are actually translating the protocol. That's what NAT64 is all about. And DNS64, it's important for us to understand it. These are two different mechanisms. What happens particularly, well, usually they're going to work at the same time. In a NAT64 network, it comes with the deployment of NAT DNS64. We're going to see why, but in practice, these are going to be two different mechanisms. As a matter of fact, I have this one as a vendor and uh, this one. But the important thing is the configuration parameters should match. So NAT64 translates the protocol and DNS64 basically will be a sort of deceit. When uh, we're going to show you the, the slides and some demos, uh, but it's going to deceive the patients, the, the clients that are IPv6 only, so that they will always obtain an IPv6 response. Here we assume that the client is IPv6 only. So why are we going to deploy NAT64 and DNS64? Basically, we know that uh, the uh, uh, exhaustion of uh, IPv4, well, we can say that there are almost none left. And we all know that there are many deployments of IPv6, IPv6 only networks. Networks, for instance, there are data centers and servers and services that are full 
only and IPv6 only. And it's not a fact to reach those uh, data centers or uh, servers. If we have an IPv4, we, we ha need to translate to get to the destination. So this is the present and the future because there are already many and we are going to have many more data centers and services uh, that, uh, for instance, in Facebook that are IPv6 only. So there are also many websites and portals that only support uh, IPv4. So we need this mechanism because we are in an IPv6 uh, and uh, we wanted to reach IPv4, we need to look for a way to reach there. So we need this with uh, 64 DNS uh, 64 because of the depletion of IPv4. So the motivation is to need uh, to, to, it's uh, to, we are, we're going to speak of the saving of uh, IPv4 um, and uh, when we speak of mechanisms of transition, we understand that uh, NAT64 and DNS64 are transition mechanisms. It's important to point out that these are divided, th these come in different flavors. There can be dual stack where you have IPv4 and IPv6 networks and uh, the protocols. And another one is the uh, capsuling where you will have, uh, you can put an IPv6 around an IPv4, and there is a third flavor of this transition mechanism that is a translation. So let's see what happens. If I, in, in this IPv4 part, I want to talk with the bottom with IPv6 network, what will happen there? Well, I won't be able to do that because uh, IPv4 and IPv6 are not compatible. So I can't have a host that speaks IPv4 and uh, with uh, an IPv4. So uh, when, when you speak of that translation, what do we mean by that? Here on the screen, we can see the two headers that you know, IPv4 header and the IPv6 header, it's quite obvious that they are very different. And if I want to uh, uh, translate from one to the other, I need to do something in this case. We are going to introduce the NAT64 translator to take one word from to the other. It's like having two people speaking two different languages. So now if you translate what you have at the left, of the diagram in the upper part. We have an IPv4 only network and here you have an IPv6 uh, network. And look at this, how interesting. For instance, in Mac, well, maybe now it's not relevant, but uh, in IP, at the IP level, we can see that it translates this, uh, this, this is the destination address and the other this is the address, this is the origin, and this is the destination uh, address. This translator should be able to take this back and translate it into this and then, and the other way back, just as, as uh, NAT would uh, operate. The port uh, also has to be translated and the data, the idea is to leave it as it is. Basically, this is what we are discussing. Now, let me tell you a bit about uh, NAT64, that it has its good things and its bad things. NAT64, it only translates um, Unicast, TCP, UDP, and ICMP, and users share public IPv4 addresses. Uh, no, um, in general terms, you're always going to have a network where you are going to use a public uh, network. As a matter of fact, we are looking for a way to save IPv4 addresses. So it will be very normal to have my IPv4, IPv6 only uh, uh, 
network and to use public IPv4 addresses. And you can also have a NAT in the world of IPv4. You maybe you can uh, um, you, you can uh, have a fewer um, uh, privileged ports, 65,000. And we are going to show the limitations later. Now, if you have an IPv6 network, we are significantly reducing maybe by 50% the need for NAT in IPv4. In IPv4, that's an important thing. You can create automatic uh, uh, translation using the static um, information. For instance, you can tell a device that it can, you can always use every time that you use this IPv6 address, you're going to have this IPv4 address. So that's completely static mapping. You can use a prefix that is uh, this one that uh, we are going to mention uh, frequently, 64. As after 9v uh, slash 96 or another. And however, because of sensible reasons, the slash 96 is going to be the prefix mostly used. Why slash 96? Well, because we are going, if I pick this slash 96 and I add 32 bits of IPv4, I get 128 bits. And with that, I form an IPv6 address. That is why traditionally in these deployments, we're going to use slash 96. So a bit about the NS64. Uh, uh, well, the IPv6 only nodes should believe that they are using IPv6 only. Okay. That is why DNS will create a false address. We're going to see this in details and how this false response is created. Now, traditionally, when we speak about NAT64, this is like a stateful NAT. However, very often when we create static mappings, this can be a stateless NAT. We have to take that into account. Traditionally, NAT64 is understood as stateful, traditionally, because you always can have an exception, of course. Now, let us have a look at this. I have several sketches that shows how this works. I hope this clears any doubts. What I'm saying now is closely directed to what my colleagues will be explaining later on. So this has to be very clear. I have an IPv6 network at the bottom and I want to reach the IPv4 network. This is a domain, etc. So these guys here can only speak IPv6. So what will they do? They're going to a DNS64 server this guy here, this host down here, I'm referring to this one here, to the DNS64 server will have to do what it has to do to reach the DNS server and obtain a response. And look at this, this guy only have this record, www.example.com and only has this IPv4 address. And here comes the magic. This guy here, this is called synthesizing. You'll take the IPv4 address and embed it, it, embed it in this prefix here or another prefix. And basically it will translate 192013. What we see here is the same wrote, written in hexadecimal. This is a response that will be provided to the client. The quad A response is the one that has to be provided. Otherwise, it cannot speak IP for. And for this person, it is totally transparent. And finally, they will be able to communicate with example.com without any further inconvenience. And here comes the deceit, this object that you have here, the DNS64 server. Now, I wanted to enter here, just bear with me a minute. Muy breve, estoy... Very briefly.
aquí en esta animación, here in this animation, I created some years ago, but uh, you can see the algorithms that take place in the in between, in order to do all the translation. Here we have a host, which is IPv6 only. So this guy here, the first thing he will do is to do a query of a domain to a DNS 6.4. And this is important when it's DNS 6.4, don't imagine it's a box and specialized and everything else. It's the same software, many do so, but this is a bind software, which is free and they can do this perfectly well with that. Now, what happened? If he receives, he received a quad A response. If, they, if he obtained a quad A response, nothing happens. The client will access and navigate this in IPv6 because there's no need whatsoever for any kind of translation. Now, if that did not happen in case this is only uh, a record, it's DNS 6.4 that will annex 32 bits that will coincide with the NAT64 prefix to the slash 96 that I mentioned earlier on. This is what the DNS64 will do. What will happen afterwards when they receive the NAT, the IPv6 client is going to need to go through the NAT64 box. And once it, he sees that the destination matches with what he had, which was had to be natted, it does the NAT translation. It gets the IPv6 packets and changes it into IPv4 because the destination is IPv4 once again when the IPv6 wishes to access IPv4. So the NAT box, this is how it works. I explained in the previous circle, it's going to determine that the packet needs to be translated based on the DNS 6.4 prefix. That is why the information that I configure in the DNS 6.4 has to perfectly match what the NAT 6.4 has. The rest, you can play around with the prefixes, but what I'm interested in is that it matches perfectly. And finally, you will be able to access the IPv4 destination. So having done this, let us go back to the presentation This has been mentioned already, the defined only for unicast TCP, UDP, and ICMP. And when can this fail? Well, this is the question. NAT64, DNS64 works well with domain DNS domain names. What happens if an application tries to use an IP address? If an IP address is not going to use DNS64, the host will have to use the IPv6 or address, which is already synthesized, it has to match with the NAT64. What happens with the apps applications that don't support IPv6? Well, they don't work because if you have IPv6 only and if the app does not support IPv6, well, unfortunately, there's no way around this. Now, for May 2021, it's very difficult to have applications that don't support IPv6, but in the event you have this doubt, well, this will not work. We already mentioned the components, NAT64, DNS64, which is optional. However, generally, they're going to go hand in hand with one another. I will now go over to the practical part because the theory was already mentioned. Okay, so we're going to see how this works because the demo works better than a thousand words. Here I have a DNS3, which is, uh, I always like to call, give it a more elegant adjective. This is an emulator. These are real hosts like Linux. So, I'm going to explain what we have here. On the left, we have virtual machines, and this is the network topology that is running. On the left, I have a client that is IPv6 only. This is the IPv6 address of that client. This is an only link IPv6 only 
link and this is the server that does matching and dns 6 so there this is the inbox but these can be different uh, boxes now traditionally they're going to be separate boxes and even brands or whatever and on the right i have a server that is ipv4 only you have a web server here which we put yesterday for this example now let's see what we have here these are the devices they're more or less in the same position as the diagram on the left ipv6 only in the middle of the server and on the right we have the ipv only for server so let's start on the left ipv6 only here i am in the device i picked it up before starting this course i haven't done anything here for example let's put here an f config we see it has absolutely nothing there and to, for the purpose of simplifying things i put this here I here have a little file called NAT64SH. This is for today's practice, very briefly. So let me explain. We have an if config NP03, which is an interface. We're telling it to pick it up and the, all the comments. And the second line configures the IPv6 addressing to the interface that I picked up before here we have a default route to that device and this can be interesting here in this last line it's indicating to this client which is a dns server it's going to be using it has to use the dns64 i'm interested in that obviously so here we see if they receive it through ra or dhc6 or whatever the important thing is that you configure it here now what happened here this guy here configured this here and it's going to tell the server to use this guy as the dns 6 for server so let us execute it briefly bash nut 64.sh i do if config and we're going to see that in fact it has an interface and it has ipv6 address and i'm going to speed up a bit because of because of shorter time so i'm going to go to the server now i'm going to go a bit slower here because here we have some configurations that could be interesting to share with you so that you can understand this better so let us let us first have the dns64 dns64 In a 6.4, at least I put it in the options. So what do we do here? The only thing that we added were these things down here, these lines here. And you might even have this here. Listen on V6. We're telling mind that it should be capable of listening in IPv6 addressing. And the second part, the DNS 6.4 is what does the magic. It's going to pick up. It's going to synthesize this using this prefix we have here. It could be another prefix, but I use this here. I use this prefix here, slash 96, which is what is recommended traditionally and the clients are going to match this with any ipv6 land it could be good it could be bad it might depend on my needs but to simplify things any client any ipv6 client will be able to synthesize this prefix here synthesizing means that if he goes to the internet and the destination the domain that they're trying to figure out only has ipv4 he's going to synthesize this and have a quad a response uh, ipv6 response to the client so this is what the dns does now let us look at this device here i used a very famous software called taiga i think the other people are going to use Joule at Lacnic. We were supported Joule a lot because it's a Latin American development. So what did we do with Taiga? This is a 
not six four zero. What do we have here then? We're going to start user toga local etc tiger. So what does this guy have here? First, we're going to create a GN interface called NAT64. This is the name of the interface. You could have called it anything. So this NAT64 interface is, this is a TIGA configuration. It's been told to use IPv4 addressing. This IPv4 addressing is recommended for different reasons. This has to be included in the TIGA processes to generate the ICMPs, which is essential so that the network understands what is happening. So we have the prefix, which does exact matching with the DNS 64 prefix. This is a dynamic pool, the IPv4 here, and this is where the blocks will be. And at the level of the addressing in the network, which is very important, this guy here has, here Tiger creates the logic interface with TUN. We put the IPv4, IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. Remember that this guy in the middle here, if it's dual stack, and then the routes which will be necessary for, for Tiger and for the computer. And finally, I restart the bind to be sure that they will be listening to all this new addressing that is placed here, and that's the reason why. So now we do bash and NAT64, and apparently everything works. Let's see if we can do ping to the client, 2001 db one, two, and the client is IPv6. IPv6 uh, only, okay. Ahora vamos muy now rápido. we are going to start very quickly. Easier still. This is the way we've done it with the rest. The only thing that you will do is raise the physical interface to the IPv4 of the uh, equipment and to, to create a route by default, this one and this one. Of course, there may be other routes if the network needs them. Now, let's see what happens. Let's go to the DNS64. We're going to use some domains that may only have IPv4. For instance, Google has a destination that is IPv4 only, and that is called ipv4.google.com. If I request the IPv4 address, do we have to wait? Connection came out. This was not in our plans. Okay, ahí apareció. Notice, because uh, what did we do here? I'm telling the DNS server, please bring the IPv4 address from ipv4.google.com and notice that it brings it perfectly well. 142, 254, 64, 06, 206, perfect. Now, what would happen if a destination that has IPv4 only, I tell, I ask to it to bring IPv6 and the, here comes the nice part. We're going to be able to see that it, it brings a NAT64 hash that, and it gave me a response. It, and it was a lie because it didn't exist. Look at this, it's interesting because we use this prefix and it synthesized the IPv4 address. If I, the, the end of it, if I pick this 8EFA40C, it will give me the IPv4 address of uh, ipv4google.com. We can do it with more, for instance, with an address. It, it, 
it's very really difficult today to find destinations that don't have IPv6. Everybody has IPv6, but uh, strangely enough, Twitter does not have IPv6. And once again, you have the need to synthesize this. If I look for domains that do have IPv6, nothing will happen. Notice that the IP address is not synthesized and so on and so forth. I won't discuss this any further. Now, what did we do with this practice? Look, this is a non synthesized address, 2001, 13C, etc. Uh, now, for today's practice, we wanted to create this destination that's called IPv6, um, IP, a cost, not IPv6, IPv4, a cost aside, dot com. You can do this. And where does this DNS registry aim at? This address and it's IPv, IPv4 only server and it will write down 192.168.12. So I do do a pin 6 to ipv4.acostasite.com and here we see the synthesized address. Now, if, even if it's an IPv4 only destination, what is happening now? We did the IP configuration, but we didn't raise the service. Notice that at the left, the client is trying to reach the server. And when I raise Tiger, that is the NAT64 server, we see that it responds perfectly well. If once again, I pick the last 32 bits, let's do it here. Well, I'd already done it, but let's check it. This C0A8 is C. I go to base 10, C0, I go to base 10, it's 192, 119, it's C0A8102, it should be 192. So I a8, I go to base 10, 168, and then it recognizes that there's a zero implicit at left, one will obviously one. One, one, and two will be two, obviously. And this is how we wrote this. And now, having said that, let's see what happens at the side of the server. In the server side, of the IPv4 only website, a server. We are going to raise a TCP DOM and the interface uh, NP0S3 ICMP. If I ping again, here we see what's reaching. So let's see what's reaching it. What's getting here, it runs a TCP DOM, and this is what uh, arrives a packet. On IP 192.168.255.254. That was assigned by NAT64. So here you see it. This is the dynamic pool 192, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And here we see the assignment of 192.168, etc. That's basically that's what it's reaching. Finally, I told you that I had raised a web server. We'll see the logs dash slash Apache 2 slash access. Let's see what uh, this uh, here we receive here. So here we will see what's reaching the Apache 2 server. Let's see what happens. I go to the client. I open a browser, Mozilla, and we're going to say, put IP4 across the site.com. And if you see to your right, please notice that what's a packet of an IPv6 only client is reaching IPv4 only servers. Everything is working perfectly well. I think that, well, I, I don't know whether there are any questions. I don't know whether there are any doubts. Let's see if there are any. I see that some people are raising their hands. Alejandro? 
Good morning, everyone. I, I, I want to help you with the questions. Calcedo is asking whether this laboratory would be available to participants. DNS, uh, I, I think that he's asking about this, that, well, honestly, I didn't upload it, but it, everything is, will be available in a blog that I will share in the chat in a while. Anyway, I've shared many DNS3 uh, labs, but with um, different equipment that are on servers that may try if necessary. But I think that the most important will probably be the NAT64, DNS64 server, but I'd be very happy to do that. The, now, the pictures must be already uploaded in the site of the course, but thank you for uh, Salcedo for bringing this. Um, Guillermo asks whether we can see the tables in, in the NAT64 server. Yes. In this file here, var log tiger dynamic dot map, you'll be able to see that. Let's take this to the background. But now, if I see this file, var log tiger, thank you for your question, because it's, it helps me point out something that is very important. In this file, we can create dynamically However, I can also edit it and create entries that are completely static. In this case, it was created dynamically, 192.168.255.234, this was assigned. This IPv4 address here corresponds to client 2001 DB8112. So this is a timeless time, that's a number of seconds uh, that went by. But here you can create the static entries and, and your question, you can see the assignments. You can edit this, you can delete it. You can even see that here it says that you can edit this carefully as long as you shut down Tiger first. Alejandro trying to pull several questions together. Now the pool, the, if it's only one IP that you're using, could you, re, could you discuss the pool relation? Yes, obviously for today's diagram, we did it in a very simplistic manner, of course. None of us will have anything as basic as this, however, what I wanted to show is not just the sketch, but the concept. Trying to respond, it's possible if I have a very big IPv6 network, of course, I will assign a slash 24 pool. I can show it again. Maybe I could put a slash 18. With IP addresses, public, public addresses or private addresses. So I might translate this to uh, private and and then you can do what you want. I may have a router here that uh, will go from private to public IPv4 to be able to navigate properly. So I am navigating here because I have access and I can manipulate this. As to the pool, let me see whether I can show it. The pool was defined USR, local, etc. they are defined here. The pool that I put here is the pool that you're going to use, dynamic pool. 192, 168, 255, uh, oh, uh, slash 24, an IPv4 pool for NAT. And here I can put a mask that adapts to my network. So thank you for the question. Good. Alejandro, could you talk about the problems of 
DNS64 and uh, with DNSSEC. Yes, that's an excellent question. Good that you mention it. That is a very important topic. Obviously, what happens here? Here I have, once again, a very basic network about an IPv6 only client. And if this client here, the client that this does not happen, but let's assume that the client wants to validate, uh, to do DNSSEC validations, this mechanism is not, not good. It breaks it, it ruptures it because of many reasons. The first of which is that one of the mechanisms that DNSSEC does is to validate whether a domain name exists or not. DNSSEC can validate if the register what A or LACNIC.net exists or doesn't exist. Now, if this gentleman forges it, it looks as a man in the middle attack. And that's why it breaks it. So that's it, 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 your question is very important because it wouldn't happen so much. This is a, a more realistic thing. I'm going to have a client here, probably the DNS may be here too, it doesn't matter. And this gentleman is going to browse very well, is going to do the internet resolutions, and IPv4 and IPv6 and do the DNS tech validations, but from here, here, nobody is manipulating the DNS responses. So what DNSSEC does, it does not cipher, but uh, it reviews the integrity of the data based uh, on digital signatures and based on FUDN uh, hashes. They call it record sets. And now, what I want to reach, if I validate DNSSEC from here, there will be no problems. Today, the clients don't do DNSSEC validation. It's done by the servers. Con tu permiso, me gustaría darle que alguien haga quizás una pregunta. Jose, if you allow me, you remember who was the first person who raised their hand? Somebody, some people had raised their hands and I'd like to give them the opportunity. Jordi Palet, este, it's vamos Jordi a... Palet. Let's give him the floor. I thought I'd seen more hands. Jordi. Hi, Alejandro, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yes. This is to add a couple of details that I think are important. The first of all is that the DNS 6.4 configuration, I understand that for your example, you try to simplify things, but it's also important to an exclusion of the IPv6 ranges that should not be translated. So for example, using BIND or other DNS servers, this is done in different ways, the idea is if you are using a certain types of addresses, for example, for other transition mechanisms or addresses. Jordi, Jordi, Jordi. You forgot to introduce yourself. Well, you, I'm Jordi Palet, and I have been working for many years now in IPv6 only and IPv4 as a service. I don't know if you followed what I was saying, I have a couple of more things that I would like to add very rapidly. Yes, we understood and go over to the couple of things that you wish to add. Yes, the other point is that there is a document called RFC 8683. And for those who wish to work with NAT64, 464 XLAT, it's very important for them to read this. And regarding the pool, we have just published a new document at IETF, which I will include in the chat. Maybe I could include it there. It's rough. Okay, I will include it there. And in the session, we analyzed which are the address pools that you need for a given number of clients. For example, with a slash 22, you can at least attend 
56,000 plants. There are some calculations in that document that you can read, but this number can be far bigger. I won't go into the details because it's very long to explain, but it's in the three, four section of the document that I will include in the chat. I will include the URL in the chat. And if we have time, you can ask me once again, and I include that. Thank you. Yes, please do include it in the chat. That would be very interesting so that everyone can have access to that document. I have I, I, I know I was discussed at, discussed at the meeting of the V6 ops. Maybe we have time for a couple of people to ask questions. We welcome questions. I, so this is how we'll be working here. Rafael Ignacio Sandoval. Rafael, good afternoon. Identify yourself. Yes, we can hear you, Rafael. Please introduce yourself. Well, this is a very simple question. In networks where there are many ISPs that are fearful of implementing these systems because the client is focused on a young public and some adults and the largest num amount of traffic is games. What can you tell us about that and how compatible this procedure is? These mechanisms with those network environments where games are used a lot, online games. Well, thank you for your question. And it's super interesting, Rafael. Let me tell you, and I'll be very frank, since the pandemic started, since March 2020, personally, I think I have um, um, worked on a lot on games and also games for children. And IPv6 is an interesting driver, or the other way around, games and console games. And I think this is more related to Xbox and so on. PlayStation 2, PlayStation is very famous regarding that and the PlayStation network. Those networks, he corrects himself. There are networks of the PlayStation consoles block a lot of IP addresses. But what I have learned is that games are very power users. I will stop here a minute because we have four minutes to go before the break. Now, what happens with games in IPv4 and why this is a driver? I hope this can help people in the deployment of IPv6. If you have an IPv4 network and you wish you have a console and you wish to play just any game, for example, FIFA and online, obviously, it's very complicated. First of all, among many things, you have to use UP and P, Universal Plug and Play. And this is a large number of ports so those people who literally wish to do damaging things to your network can do it from outside. And if you have several devices, you want this for console, but others wish to use UPnP. El port forward. This is so the port forwarding is dynamic. Port forwarding, you have to get, have a person who enters the router of the home and this creates complications. So you look up in the internet, which are the ports that FIFA uses, which is the one that used by electronic apps, which are all the other ports with every console. So in the home router, you have to do a lot of configurations, TCP, IP, and I'm going to allow until the static IP address that I included in that console. So things are complicated, but not now, those users that have consoles and have IPv6 have a, a great advantage. Last year, we discussed this with a lot of internet providers in Latin America and as LACNIC from Mexico down to Argentina. And I can tell you that there was a lot of satisfaction 
on the side of internet providers who had a large number of clients who were using online games and the problems with connection. And once they deployed IPv6, the network improved substantially and improved these inconveniences. Now, your, if your question was how do games perform with NAT64, I would dare to say that as long as it is unicast TCP and so on, there should be no inconvenience. Alejandro, there's a question from Guillermo when you showed the table for the session. You didn't show the relationship between the ports. Maybe you did this to simplify things. I think they're using for the state table. I'm not going to open this, but that table does not have any ports involved. This would be an IP tables, and that is where the state issue would come in. But in this case, there are no layer four ports involved. Now, just a couple of words for the person from Microtic Colombia, and then we finish. We just have one minute left. We close for a very short, brief break. We have a five to 10 minute break. And then Wesley Correa will tell us about 464XLAT. Please identify yourself, Microtic Colombia. Good morning. Can you hear me? Javier González. Excelente, Alejandro. Muchísimas gracias. Excellent, Alejandro. Thank you very much for your contributions. Very clear. This is very clear, particularly on topics related to ESN and NAT64. Now, IPv6 deployment is quite complicated. And regarding your comments on games, you already answered many of the questions I had. But I wanted to ask you about that. If you don't have ports in your translations, and you just mentioned that precisely, that there's no port translation. Now, the issue of port mapping, how, how does that take place? You, And this also has to do with the draft that Jordi mentioned. Now, how do you port mapping, for example, for games or for those apps that have port mapping? How do you do that? For, for, and how do you translate to NAT64? Thank you. Well, I will try to answer in a very summarized way because we are one minute past the time and in nine minutes time, our colleague Wesley should start his presentation. Now, basically here we do not have ports. This does not mean that later on we won't have ports. That is why I mentioned that here I can have my IPv6 only network. I go to the server. The server will assign a large number of IPv6 addresses. They're going to be mapped one by one dynamically with private IPv4 addresses. But later on, I will perfectly well will be able to have NAT to public IP addresses. And in those NAT, there will be the PATS port address translation. When the packet goes from one direction to the other, it has a port of origin, the port of destination. They will be mapped one by one. And when I did not mention the state is because very often this goes hand in hand with IPv6 tables and IP tables to NAT this to the world and then through masquerade and so on. So in that case, you will have ports. But no hay puerto, David. For the time being, with what I showed you, there are no ports, David. Thank you. Then this is clear. Therefore, and one thing that comes up here, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this. I will try in 15 seconds. If you don't have ports, and when you mentioned to go out to the world, this implementation you showed does not go out into the world, it's not public? Well, I could have allowed it to go out to the world, but for this to happen, you have to do a couple of more things. All right, thank you. All right, so far, we'll now resume in eight minutes time, and our colleague Wesley will speak about 464XLAT. Thank you. 
Muchas gracias, Alejandro. Muchas gracias a Thank todos. Gracias, Alejandro. Thank you, everyone. Parte. I hope you enjoyed this first part and I will have a break until 15.05 UTC so you can grab a coffee and come back full of energy for the second part. And in the meantime, let me invite you to visit the virtual show. This is a 3D experience conceived to generate a space for interaction among the participants. I also invite you to share your experiences in the social media with the hashtag LACNIC35. We hope, look forward to meeting you in a while. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly well, good. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, everyone for coming to, to this IPv4, IPv6 tutorial, now focusing more on IPv6 only for ISPs. That tutorial will be part of um, LACNIC 35. For those of you who know me, I'm Wesley Correa. I'm CEO of Telecom Consultoria Entretenimiento y Servicios. That's a, a Paraguayan company focused on uh, taking knowledge, technology, and best practice for um, the development of ISPs across the world, including, and I'm Vice President of the Brazil Peering Forum. Now, let's talk about 464 XLAT as um, a transition technique from IPv4 to IPv6 for ISPs. Let's see how the 464 XLAT works and what could be one of the possibilities for implementing that protocol by an ISP. So what is 464XLAT? It's standardized in RFC 6877, and it's a transition technique that consists in routing IPv4 packets through an IPv6 net only network. In this scenario, in the last, the end mile of I, there's only IPv6, there's no IPv4. And IPv4 is um, standard through, um, and the CPE works as the uh, CLAT, that is the customer side translator. So the ISP will take the packets that go through the IPv4 um, packets and send them to the PLAT, that is the provider side translator that converts all these packets sent to the internet. So here, the you all of this, remember everything that Alejandro said about IPv4 and DN, and NAT64 and DNS64, and how these technologies can help you make a 464XLAT work. So speaking of the ISP topology, the ISP scenario is specific for each app application. So each ISP has its own peculiarities, but the, found, the, 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 the foundations are very uh, shared by all ISPs. For instance, having a concentrator, having a CPE, having a backbone network, having access network. So when we speak of an ISP scenario, even when some devices are in different uh, sites, the idea of the network is the same. And in that concept, 464XLAT, and the CPE has a very important role because it will be the interface between the home devices and the external devices, even if the uh, residential or home devices have IPv4 only. So ISP, the ISP will make these IPv4 only devices to be able to communicate through the general IPv4 network. It, the network is going to be IPv4, IPv6, even if there's no IPv4 in the last mile. So there we have the general topology, more or less how the ISPs work and how we are going to work with 464XLAT here. We drew, uh, we sketched two different, uh, well, uh, two connections in IPv4, IPv6, but they can go through the same uh, route, the same uh, VLAN, the same uh, provider. For instance, and here in the ISP network, we have a cloud where we can have concentrators, um, etc. 
But in this diagram, we are working with, uh, with this as a concentrator that will create an IPv6 only network. So in this link between the the ng and the cpe of uh, the client we won't have any ipv4 and this cpe that will also do the role of uh, clad is the interface for all the devices whatever the devices so that all these devices may have connectivity now let's uh, conduct some tests we, we are not going to discuss uh, the 464 concept any further theoretically, but we'll see how it works with uh, the tests. And one, in one of these simulations, we did it in PNET Lab. That's a very good solution for network um, simulation. And we used outside PNET, PNET Lab, we used uh, the RB951 with an IPv6 and IPv4 network and Linux Debian with Joule and DNS 64 with Vite, the same that Alice said, and uh, the uh, CPE with Open WRT with the install with a 464x LAT packet installed. And now we'll understand from the beginning to the client all the tests, how we did this laboratory, how you can do something similar and uh, use the lab to test uh, how 464XLAT operates. For the PLAT, that is the 464XLAT concentrator, that's, it's a separate hardwood um, that we, we're going to need at slash 96 for NAT64 that we're going to use in the 464X LAT. We're going to use 64FF9D uh, slash 96. And this was explained very well by Alejandro. Why a slash 96 if we subtract um, 20? Uh, we, 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 because finally we, we want um, 32 bits. That is all the range uh, of IPv4 addresses. IPv4 addresses available public for that too. In our lab, we don't use any public addresses, but we simulated it with a private address for you to see. But it's recommendable not to use a double NAT, but always to use public addresses. Joule for NAT64, for 464SLAT, and BIND9 for DNS64. So we, we want to discuss now the configuration of Bind9 because Alejandro showed how it works and it's not difficult to do this DNS64 through Bind. And for the CP, we showed the core of the network and now for the CPE, we need an open WRT with a 464XLAT packet and IPv6 connectivity with a concentrator. So there we have a very simple network so that from this simple uh, from here you can uh, use your implementations in the concentrator we occupy ipv4 connectivity and ipv6 through the one in the lan interface it, in the interface of external connectivity LAN is going to generate in connectivity for the clients. So in that LAN interface that we have, DHCP v6 server, which is delivering slash 56 prefixes to these clients, then the routes by default IPv4, by default IPv6, and the route to send the packets to 64 FFGB slash 96. I used Tiger and now I'm using Jewel, but it's practically the same thing. This is because the packets all go out through the same uplink, through the same blank interface. You don't need to have this default route. It's going to know that it's not going to have that routing table and will validate it by the default route. At the PLAT, we're going to use Jewel and Find9. 
here we have a scenario that shows you how this laboratory has been prepared. This here is connectivity to the internet that has IPv4 and IPv6. And here we have a connection to the router. I called it core or aggregation. This router is connected to the jewel machine. And this router is also connected to my BNG. And my BNG in turn is connected to the CPE and to the devices. So, so that you can understand how simple this sketch is, a packet that The packet that goes from this computer will go to the CPE and to the BNT. If it's a packet sent to an IPv6 destination, it will reach the core and then go out to the internet. If it's a packet that has an IPv4 as destination, automatically has a 6, 4, etc. In this aggregation router, I have a route that tells me that everything that is addressed to uh, four, et cetera, et cetera, will be delivered to Joule because Joule will know what to do with that traffic. And Joule automatically will do all it has to do and return to the aggregation router to the raw core, but as a pipe. IPv4 packet and then go out to the internet as an IPv4. So this is the sketch that shows us how simple this implementation is that will serve as a basis so that you can do the IPv6 implementation. Now, let us see what this lab looks like in our lab. This is a microtic, that's a BNT, the concentrator. This is a net which goes out to the internet. In that net, we have this network that has IPv4 and IPv6 connectivity. And from there, we have the connectivity to the jewel. This wire here is a wire so that I can have external management of the CPE. But you don't need to have that connection in the real implementation that you might have. This is a CPE. This is a desktop. I have an Android device. I put an I telephone IP address, but this is a tablet system. And let us look at the curious features that this might have and how this works. Now, let us start with the micro tick with a BNG. This is a micro tick, and the interfaces I have are these. This is the uplink, this is a ETH1, and ETH2, which is like a PPOE, but is like a DHCP that goes directly to the router, to the CPE. Now, how more difficult would it be if it's like a network? No, instead of the CPE, you would have a switch. And from that switch would you the interface. Here, for example, I could include a cloud. It would be simulating everything that you have in that access network. But in order to simplify things, to understand this better, I just put a cable from here to here so that you can understand that the CPE is connected to layer two to the PNG network. Here I have the IPv6 pool. I have a prefix dedication, which is a slash for one. My provider is excellent. And well, I need a slash 40. And he says, OK, you will be assigned a slash 40. So he sends me a slash 40. And I put here slash 41 for our simulation. These are global addresses here. These are not documentation addresses in the DHCP server, a simple one with an ETH interface. and. It has the address pool PG. 
in the ISP address uh, environment, you're going to use this address for identifying the user, only the user who is up to date and will have access to the internet and the DHCP server will be enabled to deliver addresses within that range. And they're going to use this option, use radios. But it won't be necessary for this lab. And this is to show you that from IPv4 in this interface, we have that address, but it's of no use at all. Here we have the IPv4 address in up here too, which is the one we're using to manage this micro tick. So what I have here, DHCP version six server, a pool, a default route, and I have connectivity here. This is so that you can see I have nothing here in terms of NAT or no other IPv4 address. I don't have anything IPv4 at all here in this micro -tick. Now let us look at the jewel. So one of the interesting things in this router is that I don't have a address of 64 because the default route already takes that into account, the packets coming from the CPE and have the 64 as a destination, they will follow the same path as all the rest of the packets. So let us take a look at what we have in this jewel. This jewel has a couple of things here. Let's clear this, all right. So what did I do here at the jewel? Based on the jewel tutorial that is in the website, it's very simple to produce by our friend Henry. So I did some basic configurations here. These are very basic things. And this is in this text file here so that you can see that everything is simple. In the first line, I put the IPv4 routing. In the second one, I enabled IPv6 routing. Here I put a mod probe for Jewel and I added an instance here stating that the pool here is 64 colon F, F, 9, B, colon, colon, slash, 9, 6. So, Jewel will listening to all the requests coming to this address, destination, this other address, 6, 9, and so on. So, from DNS 6, 4, when we include 6, 4, F, F, 9, in the configuration of DNS 6, 4, all the destinations that don't have DNS quad A entry, so only A or IPv4, then the DNS 64 will create an address that we could describe as a fake address. 64 colon FF9B and then the IPv4 address translated to IPv6. And that packet will be recognized, that destination will be recognized by the originator of the connection, namely the device or the smartphone that only has IPv4 sub IPv6. So this will be recognized as an IPv6 address and it won't know what an IPv4 address is. Here we have the four pool configurations. I included just one private address and I included a range, a port range. But in the ISP scenario, we're going to use IPv4 ranges uh, slash 29 or whatever. This will depend on how many clients will be generating traffic through that 464 exact 
client and also the range of ports which have to be adapted to our needs. We have to create rules for TCP, BTP, and for ICMP. This other line, Joule Global Update, etc. Joule includes in the log all the assignments, all the port correlations between IPv6 and the IPv4 address. So we need to have all that logged here so that in the future we need to identify a user that used a given port in IPv4, then we will be able to identify that user. The important thing is to always treat these logs, and that's the, pur the purpose of this tutorial, we need to treat these logs, either store them in different uh, ways, but we're going to show you that it's impossible to have a log and to also identify the user. So these commands were applied to that tool. Now we have the jewel already configured. Well, let's have a look at a couple of tests. Let's see if the DNS 6.4 is working. This is a test with ipv4.google.com. In this address here, this is an IPv6 address, which is the address of my jewel of my DNS 6.4 that listens to DNS requests. And I asked a for a quad A. Now, because this URL does not have IPv6, automatically it comes in this way, and this does follows this process. So for my process the device that is connected and has IPv6 support will automatically have it through that address without any inconvenience at all. Now let us look at the following steps. Let's take a look at the CPE and what it has that is so special. This CPE is, has this packet here of 464xlat installed. You can see it here. It's 464xlat version 12 and in the network interface section, I have the WAN, which is here, as you can see in this lab, and I have the WAN, and that WAN is DHCP client. And you can see here that I have no IPv4 address in the WAN side of that CPE. And in the meantime, in the one six, I have a range, which is IPv6, which I received through DHCP slash five six. What I have here then is a CLAT. I can add this, add new interface, and automatically it is self-configured. You just have to add it here and it will do all the heavy task of configuring this part. On the LAN side, I have an IPv4, so I can deliver IPv6 through DHCP to those devices, whether smartphones or tablets or smart TV or the computer. And I also have the IPv6 network that will deliver addresses, IPv6 addresses to the devices that so require this. And in the OpenRT, I have a few things to show you. An interesting thing, IP router. As I don't have an IPv4, a public IPv4 or, or IPv4 uh, private, no type of IPv4. How can I route packets originating in an IPv4 only device? Here I have a route by default that sends everything 
all IPv4 to the device 464164. That is, it sends it through the CLAT uh, tunnel. So everything coming in IPv4 that I, I can't do anything with that, I'm going to send it through the CLAT to the PLAT, and from there, PLAT will do whatever has to be done. And we'll see what the PLAT does. Here we also have IP6 uh, route show, and here we have the route by default. Okay, we have everything here. And it tells me that it's working technically. So now let's take a look at the device to see whether it's actually working. Here, I don't know uh, whether you can see that screen very well. I hope you can see it well. I hope everything is okay. So let's get into the user Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Here I have some things open, but uh, let's uh, check some interesting things here. For instance, let's give it, let's give that ipv4.google.com a ping. This is an address that we know that is IPv4 only. And there we have the responses by that ping. Now, how do we get responses by that ping if the device is IPv4 only and the CPE has IPv4 only in the internal segment and has nothing in the external segment? Here, we can take a look at the tool tail slash var slash log slash sys log and we see that it's doing the mapping. It's mapping an IPv6 uh, 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 address with a port to an IPv4 with a, a port. And here we can see, for instance, ICMP. And I didn't give that ping to anybody else. That ICMP is the ping that we are sending to this address, the Google address. Here we have some sites in IPv4 and IPv6. For instance, this is a very well-known site for those of you who like to watch videos and now also some of you who are attending through LACNIC's uh, YouTube uh, channel, please um, give it a like and invite your friends. And here you you, you see uh, YouTube is IPv6, fully, fully IPv6. And in that scenario, we have IPv4.google.com that's going to load even if I change the screen here, let's see some more mappings. We have this site too, that is the ABC and the home page is IPv4 only. Let's, there are other sites that are IPv4, uh, uh, telecom TV, uh, telecomt.net is IPv4 only. Let's see it, how it works. I don't want to be redirected to another site that has IPv6. Uh, and here you see the mapping that was done. Let's give it a ping. Telecomt.net. And there we we'll see that we only have IPv4. If we give a ping 6, you'll see magic. What's the magic? The magic is that Joule turns an IPv4 only address um, to be something that may receive uh, requests and answer requests from IPv6. So we have here, we can try for you to see. Let's give a dig, dig telecomt.net. And A, you see that doesn't have IPv6, only the P entry that was given by DNS64, and we request for the same address, and the A entry, and there we have 107, 178, um, etc. This was the address that we had here. Now, 
Now let's make it a bit more difficult. Here we have IPv6, IPv4 working perfect. Now let's make it a bit more difficult starting this Android. And I was very surprised with this Android because my intention when I put that Android was to simulate how a device with uh, both the IPv4 and IPv6 work and how everything would work. But I was surprised because for some reason, this Android receives the IPv6 uh, addresses, but they don't work. So let's understand how the device, our device that is IPv4 only operates in a network that uh, lack in IPv4 in the last mile. And this is what generates compatibility with the smart TVs that are a bit older or the MOBAs that are a bit older, some monitoring systems that are a bit older, and they will understand how that would work. Here we have the Android tablet. It's a bit slow because this is a simulation scenario. So we have to wait until it appears. I'm also monitoring my time to see how much I have left. So this ABC side, I had preloaded it, so it's loading again. I turned this tablet on a while ago, so, so it should, I, we shouldn't have to wait. It's loading. Here you can see it in the bar. Okay. Ready. So it's almost loaded. There's an interesting thing here. Here. I open configuration settings so, so that you may see that it has IPv6, IPv4 system, bow tablet. Okay, here we have the IP address part, 192.168.1.164. That is the range, 192.168.1.1.24. And he, we have 2804.32.70.80. That is the same range of IPv6 that is being delivered. However, let's look. I'm going to show you that it doesn't work, that IPv6 doesn't work there. So let's see that. Let's wait a bit more. It's loading. This address, this is what I wanted you to see. It's ipv6.google.com and it's trying to load and it, it won't. It won't. It doesn't work. Okay. In the meantime, the ipv4.google.com address works. That is that in that tablet, we can say that that tablet is our own smart TV that we wa want to throw to the garbage can, but we love it. We have a sentiment, they have sentimental value because it can still be of some use. You say, no, there's too much uh, IPv6 traffic now and it doesn't support it. Now it can support it through the 464XLAT because 464XLAT will automatically translate all the IPv4 into IPv6 requests for that smart TV, doing the mapping through Taiga or, or, or whatever, what other uh, or other solutions that use 464XLAT. So it's a very interesting solution to migrate IPv4 networks into IPv6. Let's open the same site that we had tried earlier that has IPv4 only. And there you can see that it works. It works and 
you didn't add any additional details, no changes in setting, no DNS setting. Everything is done automatically. It's delivered to the final devices at the client's home through the CPE that is here with the open WRT. And so we'll have some time for questions, but of my final remarks, if now, if you just requested ASN uh, number resources, you may have realized that there's no more IPv4 available for anybody. You have to enter a queue and every day it's longer and longer and even longer. Well, if there's ever one available of um, an IPv4 range, even if it's a slash 64, uh, maybe LACNIC will be kind enough to uh, award it to you, but respecting the queue. If you enter the queue today, it would take very, very long. With 464X LAT, it's possible today immediately to start work with IPv6 and to provide full connectivity to the user. That is, that what you will need is nothing but a small range from the operator slash 25 slash 27 that will depend on the number of clients. In my company, I have uh, uh, students, clients and ISPs in the 14 countries and, and the ISPs go from 50 to 30,000 clients and an ISP with 1,000 clients, a small range of uh, IPv4 is enough. As Alejandro said, you save a lot of IPv4 using NAT64 or 464XLAT. The only issue is that we were highlighting what Alejandro said. It's May 2021. Please, for God's sake, don't buy any routers or CPEs, etc. that and don't have IPv6 support, nothing. Because if you, anything that you're buying today that has no IPv6 support or support to 464XLAT, you are buying trash, old things that you won't be able to use in a very, very short time. It will be useless. So please use your money well. Buy devices with IPv6 support and with the 464 XLAT. So using a good CPE with 464 XLAT or with, uh, you will be able to start now using that range of IPv6 because I know some ISPs that requested the ASN and the IPS and uh, have the IPS uh, uh, not being used and paying LACNIC membership uh, every uh, or constantly, and they're not using it at all. And that's um, they're using the for uh, they're using uh, 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 quadruple uh, NAS, um, and they risk um, to fall. Sometimes the very few IPs a transit provider was given a slash 25, a slash 28, and they are doing the click of not risking to block the PlayStation or blocking Google or blocking Netflix. So don't do that. Start now using your IPv6 only networks using the tools available in the market. Zool is free of charge. It's developed by Nick Mexico in our community. You have the documentation in um, the uh, LACNIC uh, website and in YouTube, you have many, many videos that uh, tell you how to install and how to conf uh, configure it. And so we are in a way to an IPv6 only. Any doubts, any questions? Hola, Wesley. Hi, Wesley, how are you? Yes, we have a couple of questions here. All are very interesting questions. 
The first one is from someone who hasn't identified themselves. How can you dimension these dual servers that are serious? Is there a recommended um, amount uh, for users? How do you manage failover? Well, Joule did a lot of tests, uh, capacity, bandwidth, the number of packets and users. And I think that the best is to check with them directly to see which is the best implementation. They even have some recommendations for example, network interface and very a couple of details that are very important to take into account when you wish to implement 464x LAT through Jewel. As regards failover, I would recommend having another server and manage it with a different redundance protocol that you can use without any issues. And this is how you can manage this. Or also, you can assign two or three slash nine six different, uh, which are different. In the case of your your server might crash, so this adds an additional slash nine six range. So this could should then be done manually. You could automate automate this using some scripts. I this won't be wouldn't be so complicated. So the option you mentioned regarding with ERP, you can have some kind of redundancy. Otherwise, uh, uh, leaving it on loan. For those who don't know VRP, this is a very automatic protocol. It's like an open source version of other options. Thank you for your answer. Let me add something regarding Jewel. At LACNIC, we have always supported development, and Jewel goes runs through kernel, and this makes it very efficient. Giovanni Avendaño is asking if the recording will be made available. Yes, in LACNIC's channel, and I think that starting tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, these will this will be made available. Our presentations are available in the website of the event and also all these videos. There is a question, Wesley, from Douglas Fisher. This question is in Portuguese. Would you like me to read it out or would you like to read it? This is from Brazil. Yes, no problem at all. The question is whether the Jewel tools and Tiger can be compared to the predefined NAT methods or bulk port allocation. Yes, you can do this determination in the sense of which IPv4, IPv6 ranges to use. And in the bulk port allocation, this is very interesting Uh, let me share my screen once again. So I can show you here, for example, one of the log lines shows that the relationship of the ports between IPv4 and IPv6 has been forgotten. It was forgotten in the table. If you haven't used the connection for a long time, Joule turns this table off and enters this port range in its space to assign to other clients. So this is something for saving purposes. That is why we mentioned that a lot of IPv4 is saved because while you use a port and the, then this is applied, but uh, when it's no longer used, it is then can then be used and, 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 and taken out. We still have five minutes left. There are two people who had raised their hands and then look at another question from the Q&A. 
I wish to mention that LACNIC for this event has included new things, for example, the option to use a microphone to raise your hand. And there is also a group, you have different ways of contacting the participants. We have something called Discord, which is an app. It's like it, it can be used, we're using it for the very first time in our events, and we'd like to encourage you to connect through that option. Many of us are already in Discord, and we can chat directly and maybe answer questions that we're unable to answer during the presentation. And also, if you have any questions, I will now give the floor to Veronica Badillo. Please introduce yourself and from which organization you come from. Veronica. Veronica. We cannot hear you, Veronica. All right, let's wait a while. And Diana will, will give you the floor now. Please. What is your question, Diana, Milena? We cannot hear Diana. Maybe she raised her hand, but is no longer at her computer. So before going to the question of Microtech Colombia, let's look at one of the questions included in the Q&A box. And this question is asked by Sherman Osepa. Greetings to everyone. As I have to look at the policy for using NAT. No, how can I view the NAT policy use? In the past, LACNIC was promoting the direct use of IPv6 and not so much using NAT. What has changed now? Have I missed anything out? Well, and Sean, the next speaker will also refer to this. Wesley, could you answer this question, please? Well, NAT is like a necessary evil. IPv6 does not have direct connection with IPv4. And each speaks with their own. For example, it's as if would I speak to someone from Japan, but I have no interpreter to help me out to see what I say to them and vice versa. So in this case, we're exclusively speaking about NAT64 and 464XLAT. So networks that are IPv6 only can reach websites that still have IPv4. And this is a big mistake. We had a long time in order to do this implementation. Most of the additional services already have IPv6 support. So when we speak about NAT in this sense, we're speaking about the necessary translation so that two different types of addresses can speak with one another. It's not that LACNIC is promoting this. It's totally the other way around. At this tutorial, we're speaking about IPv6 only, delivering IPv6 to everyone. There are sites that don't have IPv6 yet and devices that don't provide support to for IPv6. We have to guarantee connectivity. We cannot leave those people in isolation. So that is why we are using NAT, and that is why we refer to this in this tutorial. We have one minute left. Thank you very much, Wesley. It's great when you support us with these tutorials. The person from Microtech Colombia, you have about 10 minutes to ask you, 10 seconds to ask your question. And Wesley, maybe you can briefly answer that. Thank you once again. I'm David Gonzalez. 
from Microtech here in Colombia. In Wesley's laboratory, and congratulations on your very clear uh, tutorial and lab, I see that you delegate a prefix by IPv6. That is a PV, uh, IP prefix that would be used by Joule for the translation. Is that so? But I see that you deliver. Those who use Microfic might be aware of this. That this is not, they don't deliver IPs, but they deliver prefixes. Are you going, are you going to deliver that prefix through Joule? I don't know if I made myself understood, but I've tried to respect the time I was allocated. Yes, I understood your question, but that's not the case. The prefix is delegated. It's a global prefix that can be used so that all clients can have connectivity to the internet. This Joule prefix is a prefix that is only used for the answers. For example, I'm making a request to the site example.com. They only have IPv4, but my request is sent through my global IPv6 to that DNS 6.4 that is going to check in the root server that that example.com has no IPv6. So this will create a fake IPv6 address with this 6.4, etc., and will deliver this address to answer my request, my DNS request. So these are two different ranges. The microtech range can be used to make all devices have IPv6 connectivity. The dual range and the DNS64 can be used so that the IPv6 devices, IPv6 only devices can reach a destination that is IPv4 only. So only it only does the translation part. Okay, thank you, Wesley. Thank you for your question. Wesley. Thank you so much for your presentation. This is a time where I would like, I'd love to have some virtual applauses. And thank you for your support and the work and the laboratory you prepared. We thank you very much. And we have now run out of time. Later on, we will have Jose Gregorio Cotua, who will be making a presentation. And all these topics are related to one another. Paula, let's go over to the wrap up part of this section. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wesley, for your presentation. And I invite you to a break until 700 UTC for the last segment of this tutorial. We look forward to seeing you once again. And before leaving, we invite you to log in and access the virtual fair, which in addition to the sponsors stands and like Nick stands, you have the opportunity to interact with other participants and make video calls. So we meet again at 1700 UTC. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jose Gregorio Cotua. And uh, this now I'm going to speak of the SIT data center transition mechanism and to talk about some theoretical aspect uh, of the operation and to, to give you a demo as my colleague to see how it works. I work with Simeon Company in Chile. That's a company I work for. And of course, I collaborate with LACNIC with events of this kind. So my colleagues have already told you about the transition mechanisms before this protocol. And they have told you that we are always speaking of a number of transition mechanisms within or focusing to IPv6 only. That's a philosophy that they were designed for. So, first of all, let's discuss these motivations. Why should we think of a an IPv6 only setting, why is it convenient? Alejandro Costa told you that in the past, the transition mechanisms were focused on using dual stack or encapsulations. And today, the, mm, the 
the newest, the most recent are based on uh, translation and the more related to IPv6 only because of the complexity that you are stuck in place in terms of planning, network management resources, the depletion of IPv4, all those issues. And in some cases, the deployment of complex networks, including, for instance, networks of, of operators that have millions of um, uh, customers, dual stack is quite complicated. So, but on the other hand, there are other issues to be considered when deciding um, why to deploy IPv6 only and use these mechanisms that uh, would uh, help us con uh, control a range of situations. And this has to do with the efficient usage of the resources available, the very few resources still available of IPv4. And here is an interesting thing, and that's why I like the SIT data center so much. And it is that when we try to solve the problem of connectivity of data centers in IPv6 only systems by using mechanisms like this, like SIT data centers I will show in a few minutes, we become highly efficient in the use of IPv4 resources remaining because there are many, many servers that typically we use uh, under data center scenarios that not necessarily need to have IPv4, such as the support servers, such as databases, uh, uh, radios, uh, et cetera, uh, uh, TACAS, radio TACAS, uh, and AAA. So I can be very efficient using the resources if I go to uh, to IPv6 only and using only and leaving with IPv4 what is really absolutely necessary. Let me give you a, a very specific example. It's very common in ISPs, for instance, to use a slash 30 assignment to uh, for a server. And you will know that a slash 30 is for IP addresses when I end up using only one because one is a broadcast, etc. And with this mechanism, with a slash 30 that are four IPs, really assign one single IP. And with translation, uh, each server or each application with that same slash 30, I can solve the problem of connectivity for four servers. So there we see an important uh, advantage. And the other issue of why it's good to think of IPv6 only in a data center scenarios is that, and, and this question, this was asked uh, to Wesley in the previous presentation, in IPv6 so far, just having IPv6 is not 100% uh, enough because there's a lot of the internet that continues to work in IPv4 and we need, and Alejandro Costa mentioned it also, we need to these devices, servers, or clients that would be IPv6 only, they need to reach IPv6 only, IPv4 only um, clients. So that is why we have the uh, 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 other app, uh, mechanisms. So really, when we see the landscape oriented to IPv6 only, there are things that need to be solved still. And these mechanisms uh, are complemented and solve those issues that if we had IPv6 only alone, we would not be able to solve. Here I put a chart that very briefly shows a comparison between the needs for connection of IPv6 only, NAT64, DNS64, 464XLAT, and now SIT data set. And I need to solve Connectivity of six to six, six to four, six to four, but with binding of IP reform, that's a problem of NAT64, one of the problems of NAT64, and that is uh, uh, solved with 464XLAT. The, uh, and, and then uh, inbound uh, connections that can be solved with NAT64 with static connections incoming from four to six, and the SID data center somehow complements uh, the entire thing and uh, solves another part of the problem with some improvements, depending on how you 
you see it. And there's an important thing, and it is that if you work stateless or stateful, and if I reuse the IPv4 with a one, one, um, etc. So let's focus on SID data centers. That's what we want to focus on today. But as Alejandro told you, and this is important, is that you should always see the system as a whole because these transition mechanisms were not designed to compete against each other or to replace each other, but rather to complement each other. So in a few minutes, I'm going to show you an image where I show that it is possible even to use them at the same time, simultaneously to solve each of these specific problems. And situations, uh, the situ situations are solved as they appear because these mechanisms solve situations and they do not exclude each other. In the case of state data center, the philosophy is to be able to, to permit them, um, well, the unicast traffic, TCP, UDP, uh, there are other traffics uh, that are also need to be dealt with, but there are other mechanisms and other techniques for that. But with unicast TCP and UDP, we stop much of the traffic, especially inbound and outcome coming uh, traffic on the internet. So state data center with a very important, with a very peculiar uh, infrastructure because we work stateless, we simplify a bit because we use only one component. You'll see that it's uh, faster and more efficient. That is the, the relay of the state data center. But the idea is to allow for 40 to 64 trans, uh, translations very efficiently. Let's discuss the technical issues. In this diagram, what I intend to do, let's see. In this sketch, I illustrate the infrastructure and the philosophy of the city at the center. The idea is that we have a network, in this case, to your left, an IPv4 only network, it could be the internet or a part of the ISP network that because of uh, any issue could not transition to IPv6, you know that you will find servers and devices or apps that bec maybe because the vendor is no longer there because they don't have a support, but we need to continue to use them. So they need to remain in IPv4. So this IPv4 only, maybe anybody you can imagine from the simplest uh, server to a network that we continue, uh, that needs to continue to be IPv4 and even the internet. And this side, we have the newest uh, IPv6 um, networks that deploy in IPv6 only. It could be a data center. It could be a part of the new network that I'm deploying. And I do it only in only in IPv6 version. And I need the two networks to communicate with each other. That is that IPv4 clients may access IPv6 services all the other way around. Or that data centers in IPv6 may access the IPv4 internet or that clients in IPv4 in the internet may access the services that for some reasons that I will discuss later, it's perhaps it's preferable to host an IPv6 server. So there are many needs. Now, the common denominator is that I need to solve the connectivity from four to six and from six to four in a different way as I would with NAT64, but not thinking of replacing NAT64, but to complement it, to solve some problems that are not solved by NAT64. So what I'm going to do is that now I have a new component from the functional point of view, there's a new component in the system. We'll call it the state data center border relay, uh, the uh, state data center router that will have one face toward IPv4 and another one to IPv6. It has to be a router and it has to be a dual stack because as Alejandro Costa said, if we want two languages to communicate with each other, we need a translator. This is going to be the translator. And under the routing scheme, it will allow the packets to flow transparently. You'll see that it's very transparent with some details that you have to pay attention to, but in essence, it's transparent. So you'll have a, 
translations from 6 to 4 and from 4 to 6. So let's see some details of uh, the translation and how the mechanism works, how the translation gets done. Let's see the technical details. This slide shows you the, the, the technical file of this protocol, of this mechanism. So the first thing that we need to say is that even when the standard is the RFC 7755, it's almost five years old, actually 7755 was the defined the operation framework for the mechanism. However, we need another RFC, previous RFCs to be able to work. One of them is 6145 that defines how to convert from four to six at the header, because as Alejandro said in the first intervention, when you exchange a packet from four to six, the fields are not the same. There are some fields that are in IPv4 that are no longer there in IPv6 and uh, the other way around. We have the extension headers. So that protocol solves that issue. It's a more detailed uh, thing that I won't discuss today because of the time constraints. And then we have another thing that I have to solve that is how the addresses are translating, the algorithm mapping, what you would regularly see is the algorithm map, mapping, what Wesley discussed. So we maintain this same mapping in seat data center, uh, but in a differentiated way that uh, is uh, the, the standard. Now there's a new standard, 7755, that enters the explicit mapping, the so called uh, EAM table. So it's important for you to read RFC 6052 and RFC 7757 because it's the introduction, it's all the technical aspects so it's a mechanism that works with one single component it's a component that is very efficient more than that 64 and because it's a uh, stateless not stateful and for issues of scaling we can use multiple translation prefixes and have traffic distribution or traffic balance we can have several translators and each group with a prefix. So managing routing so I can manage the load with different translators. In the case of translation prefixes, the same standard defines at least two options, namely to use one that is defined by the standard, which is 64FF9B slash 96, which is very well known. And the other option is to use prefixes of the same operator of the slash 32 and first the slash 48. But I would suggest that in the addressing plan to consider a special prefix for the translations. I personally prefer using an ISP prefix because there are very, very many, and it can be part of my plan. And I can also have filtering policies and so on for logging associated to that prefix. And the other thing is that I can manage this traffic to and from the internet. And I can agree with other ISPs for agreeing on cross traffic from ISP to another ISP, but using well known prefixes. This is just one which is dedicated to be used within the network. Another important aspect is that the IPv4 network and the IPv6 network don't require any kind of adjustments. No adjustment has to be done to the devices. Communication is transparent. They just have to indicate to the translator, and you'll see in a while that this is very simple. And this is specially conceived for traffic between client and server. So if it works like HTTP, it works with this translator with a couple of tweaks that I will explain in a while. And then you have technical details. For example, this goes hand in hand with routing because I have to do routing with a prefix so it goes through the translator. And this is the role of the network administrator. 464XLAT can be integrated with DNS64, paying attention 
to the GNS64 and reflecting in the synthesis the IPv4 prefixes in IPv6. And then this can be cross-cutting to the three mechanisms. So it is possible to do this. And the most important thing about this mechanism, well, everything is important, but in this case, what I like to pay attention to is that this is a mechanism that allows deploying translations with high performance. Because this is stateless, then practically the performance, the dimensioning and the traffic capacity is what the hardware allows you to have the hardware where that function is located. Today we have some that have devices that have a lot of hardware and can manage a lot of traffic. Maybe even more with, I mean, you can use several translators in the network and I can do traffic balance or even have ECMPs. I can have high availability. This is a question that was asked this morning to the speakers. And I can use any redundancy mechanisms or high availability mechanisms like VRP, HSRP, DR, BD and so on in the event of having some kind of failure. And because this is stateless, it doesn't matter if there is uh, commuting because the router doesn't store any information on the state. But not everything is perfect. And this protocol, this mechanism has some limitations. So that is why it's important to take these tutorials and to be prepared and to practice, make demos. There is a lot of information available in the internet. There are many experts in Latin America and in Europe. And of course, LACNIC is the main pillar for us in Latin America because they provide all the information we need. And I have detected three or four things that we have to pay attention to. These are not problems that cannot be solved, but we have to pay attention to these things to figure out how we can find solutions to them. One is that there is a new component that we have to incorporate. So we need to have a device and put the data center relay. Some manufacturers have taken time to provide this support, Microtik so far. Maybe they have done so, but I haven't seen the updates, but they don't have this kind of support. So it would be great if they would provide this because many SIITs in Latin America <coughs> do not. Some have a support, but others haven't updated the support. Then there's an issue regarding the translation, particularly when we work on the border in the terms of the size of the packets. This is for translating IPv4 to IPv6, and the header of IPv4 is 20 bytes, and the IPv6 is 40 bytes. And if I work with 1,500 bytes, then I will have problems regarding the packet size in the interface, because now the packet is much higher, because the header size is different. Those are details that we have to pay attention to. And this you can find solutions to using the MTUs and the servers and routers. And maybe the most limiting factor or issue is that because I only do translation of the headers, this protocol does not alter aquellas aplicaciones que mapean. Okay, those that do mapping of the addressing information, the IPs, and these are going to have some details because the packet arrives with a different IP compared to the one that has been mapped. The most well-known one is when you have validations from four to six and from six to four, because in those cases, the DNSSEC might fail. There are some ways to find solutions to this. For example, making the DNS and the validations to go from six to six or from four to four. Another application that I have seen that fails is 
telephony, voice over IP, if you're going to do an upstream in six, and this will fail if you do it with uh, four done, because the contact information is mapped in the payload and that will fail. But there are ways to figure solutions, uh, figure out solutions for this. And some, uh, I would say that 95 to 98% of the applications, and this is a message, of course, for those who develop applications, to try and make these applications based on DNS and not do mapping on the payload. So I think that is what we're going to have from now onwards. So having looked at these theoretical aspects, I would like to show you how this works. Here I have a couple of slides to show you how the mechanism works. This is quite a simple mechanism and I like it personally quite a lot. So let us see how this works. The first thing that we have to understand is that the entire traffic from six to four and from four to six has to go through the border delay. And speaking about the border delay about one, but you might have several border relays. And in that case, I have to work with the prefixes. This prefix is translated by this relay and this one by this other one and so on or I work with SMP and I send packets through different relays. But we have to understand how this works. So let us see what happens when we have one delays in the border where one is four and another network is IPv6. The first thing that we have to understand is that change from four to four, four only happens at the level of the headers. And in that case, we have the different standards. Standard 6052 does algorithm mapping, 6145 defines how the fields will change, and RFC 7757 defines a new structure of a new table that we call an EAM table, and I call it the routing table. Here we'll have a table. This table does not happen automatically. You have to fill this in. You have to configure this table. <clears throat> Here I see not a lack of deficiency, but work that has to be done, which is including the maximum of algorithms. This is not too clear yet. You have to fill this in all manually, but it will be too good to analyze how we can fill in these tables based on the routing protocols like OSPF or BGP with BGP and so on. I don't know if work is being done on those line, in those lines. So that's the first thing that we have to understand. The translations are translations one to one, but these are defined on a table. Let's see how this happens. This table, we're going to call the EAM table. It has to be explicitly configured. You have to go with commands or with the graphic environment and say, well, this prefix will be translated with this other prefix and you'll get an example. <clears throat> and the router, whenever they receive the IPv6 packet, goes to the table, it translates it and routes it towards the IPv4 table. Whenever it receives an IPv4 packet, it translates it and sends it to the IPv6 table. The IPv4 and IPv6 devices are transparent and they don't even realize that there is something in between that is doing the translation. They also don't realize this with a NAT64. But this one is more efficient. I will, in the coming minutes, I will explain how this table operates. And once I finish this, I will give you a brief demo. So basically, the table has two columns. One column defines prefixes and prefix lengths in IPv4, or prefix and mask, and prefix and length, prefix length in IPv6. The translations are one to one, but I can define these as a block. I can define a translation of a slash 32 to a slash 128, an IP with another IP. I receive this IP and it's, and it's matched with this other one. So that's the most simplest form of translation. But if I want to define translation, define translations as a block, in other words, for an entire slash 24, I have to see which is the IPv6 image to which I have to translate it. It's one to one. If I define a slash 24 with a slash 120, I have 256 addresses here and 256 here. So it's important to use a video because it's much clearer. 
I think you can see me, right? Uh, Alejandro, yes, can you confirm? Yes, okay. Yes, we can see you. We can see how you're waving your arms. So this table shows how I can map a slash 30, a slash 29. And the most interesting thing about this protocol is that I can map the entire IPv4 network, the entire IPv4 network in IPv6. So I can map the slash zero, the entire slash zero in IPv6. So you can see the entire IPv4 network with a translation that is stateless. So let us see how this occurs. Here I made a couple of examples. If you receive an IPv4 packet, then this IPv4 will go to the column of a table where you have the prefix that has the best matching with the highest mask, and it looks up the equivalent, equivalent in IPv6. It obtains the suffix, the prefix of IPv6, and then completes it with zeros. And this has been defined between the 6145 and the 6052. So it might sound complex, but you're going to see this very clearly in a while. So when the opposite happens, when an IPv6 packet comes in, I do the search. If there is an entry, I process, and if there's none, I discard. I go in through six, I go out with four, and I have an IPv4, and it's one to one. H IPv6 will have an IPv4, and I, IPv4 will have an IPv6. It's not an N1 and to one, but I can define this block by block. Let me give you an example. Esta tabla de traducción. Y a mí me llega un paquete con origen o destino, muy importante que en la, en la traducción involucra las dos IP, la origen y la destino. Y a mí me llega esta IP, la 10.09.75. Entonces, cuando llega esta IP... So, when I receive this IP, the mechanism says, ready, I have to explore this table through IPv4. So he realizes that the prefix that does the matching with the largest mask is this one. So I said, okay, with this IP and with this prefix, I do an operation and I remove the suffix 75 based on the false name. So once I have this, I, here you have the equivalent in extra maximum. And so I took, I take this and I annex the suffix of IPv4 and I generate this IPv6. So what the mechanism did was through the table, whenever I, I know that whenever I receive this IP, I translate it into this. So in a nutshell, this is how it works. So I can define in block translations from four to six and from six to four, always. And both ways and transparently. So now let me show you, I only have two slides of the theoretical part and then we we'll see a very simple demo. How do you do this? Because the theory and the table are okay, but I have a method that is very, very simple. Let me explain it. Imagine that you have two networks. This is just for one example, an IPv4 network, I put the name, Remember that uh, there is the IPv4 for documentation, and this is here you have uh, this uh, network 203 0113 24. And what to communicate with the green network? I want to communicate uh, uh, slash 24 to slash 64, but this one has 256 B, and here, uh, but slash 64 has millions of IPs. So really a slash 64 with a slash 24, I won't be able to do it fully. That is, all the IPv4 can be mapped in IPv4, but not in IPv6, but not the other way around. So I'm going to have to choose a set of this slash 64, and I'm, I'm only going to be able to represent 
up to 256 devices in the world of IPv4. So what do I do? What's the procedure? If you do that procedure, it's very simple. What I have to do is the, the IPv4 network, I'm going to look for an image to represent it in the world of IPv6. Here I have it. And how do I do that? Well, use translation prefixes. In this case, define a prefix 2001 db 95 c 95 c slash 120. It's very easy. The difference from this with 32 is the same as this one with 128. So a slash 24, I can represent it as, a, as an uh, slash 120. So that's the way I see this uh, guy of IPv4 and IPv6. And I do, and here, the part that corresponds here, I would represent it in the world of IPv4 as this block. I also need an IPv4 prefix. Be careful. I need um, a prefix, uh, a full prefix for going from six to four. So when I have this, I have to translate it. The table is filled like this vertically, but the translation occurs that or horizontal. So what I have to tell the device is that that when I receive this IP on top, it has to translate it into the other one at the bottom, the red one. And the same happens here. Okay, so that's the easy way. Some applications and deployment scenarios, there are many, many. I have identified from four to five uh, apps that are very clear. I'm going to show you three and then the demo. Very simple. As this translates from six to four and from four to six, and this is in in the new uh, documentation, but I like this deployment and I always put it as an example. Now I have an IPv4 data center with another one of the IPv4, but I have an IPv6 only network. So I put a translator here and here, I go from four to six. I transport it in six and then from six to four, I have tested this and it works wonderfully. Of course, with the limitations I mentioned earlier with the payload issue and the addresses. And it's very simple because the same translation that I do here, I do it here. So the tables are identical. I then do also do it the other way around. If I have IPv6 data centers and I wanted to, to transport it through an IPv4 uh, support, a uh, microwave uh, uh, link or something I bought from my mother, uh, in addition to the one that I showed earlier. So, and with this, I'll finish the theory and we'll go to the practice. The scenario that I like the best of the protocol is that it, it, this allows me to define in a deployment to use the three and define the three protocols. I have a data center and I say, I need to solve the traffic from service data centers toward IPv6. I don't have to use any mechanism system 626, as my call, previous colleague said. There's no impact of any of these mechanisms. From 6 to 6, it's native traffic and it goes this way. So that has been solved. Now, if that server needs to access IPv4 internet, that there are a typical case is the banks. The banks have delayed their transition. So I use NAT64 or 464X flat, any of the two. So I may have a border router that does NAT64 or PLAT. And with that, I solve that traffic. And I assign a prefix for the traffic from six to four. And with that, my servers will go to uh, IPv4 with no problems. And now there's another part. So I may have another border in another equipment that may solve the traffic from six to four, but stateless. And it could also solve the traffic from four to six with IPv6 only data centers that give provide service to uh, clients with IPv4. So I may have one router solving six six, another one six four, and another uh, six. For four and for six, I may have the three and I may define the route through which I want to handle the traffic. I like this scenario a lot because it mixes and what is not solved by one is solved by the other. Obviously, it's a more complex scenario and I need an additional planning. 
but it's very interesting. I have deployed it and really it works very, very well. And the issue of DNS stack, finally, you can, a case that I really like of putting a DNS here is that the DNS may stop the queries through 6.6 and may do it with DOH that is encrypted traffic, but may attend a, a client in, with IPv4. That is, you can handle this symbiosis of uh, providing service to clients with IPv4, but I finally stop them with IPv6. Let's go hands on. How, how long do I have to? Just five minutes. Yes, yes, go ahead. Five minutes, that would be wonderful. So what I did for practice, well, in the, the practice, I have a NAT64. I won't discuss that because Alejandro already addressed that. And there is a PLAT here. I won't touch that. I'm only going to mention the C data center. And what I'm going to do is very simple. Here we put a C data center, a border relay. We did it with Linux, with Joule. Joule is a very good tool. I recommend it. I'm going to give you the link. And there you have all the documentation. Really, it's a wonderful tool. And you, you can test it, you they explain how to install it, how to use it. It's very, very comprehensive. So this device is around uh, Linux and it's here. There's an, the internet, look look at this. It's the IP4 only network is all internet. And I want that network to see as if it were in IP4 a server that I have in IP6 only. Here I placed an an IPv6 only network, but I made it more complex here. I have a market tick that is in routing because that's another issue. The IPv6 only router, or IPv6 only client does not have to be directly related, uh, uh, linked to the uh, router. It, it may be uh, somewhere else in the network. And there you have the IP addresses. And I'm going to focus exclusively in how you configure the relay. Well, that of the server is putting the IP, putting the route. And the important thing is that when you have a NAT64 and a relay, you are going to have to route, route the prefix. This one goes here. Well, this one in Mikrotig and the prefix that we use here for translation goes here. So I can reach the internet. Notice how interesting I can reach the internet through here, but also, and I'm going to show it right now, I can reach this way. You're going to see how. So look at this. I'm going to apply the technique that I mentioned. I need this server, that's one server, one IP here. The example is the other way around. I did it like this for you to, to see how. This server IP is a slash 24, uh, 100. If I have uh, 100 servers, I repeat it, hundred times so I do it in block and I want this to be seen in all with all the internet with this this with this through this device what do I do I look for an IPv4 image of I, this IPv6 and in this case we are using a, an IP of a, a server in Salta Argentina whom I thank for allowing me to use their prefix and their platform so I say, uh, this server, I'm going to represent it in, in uh, IPv4 with this IP. This is the IP that I'm going to see of this server in IPv4. And the IPv4 network has to be represented in the IPv6. And I choose a prefix, 28036C091C96. C I, I recommend you to define that in the routing plan. In this case, I'm not using the, uh, um, well, once I define this, I have to translate. Look at the table at the bottom. This slash 32 is represented through this slash 128, and this slash zero is represented by this slash 96. And that's all. Now we're going to see how it's done. I recommend you that whenever you do anything, please, see what you're going to do or what you have to do and then see how, so plan it. Just take a piece of paper and then say, so how do I do this that I want to do? 
An important thing in Linux is that if you're going to work it in IPv6 only, remember the issue of the repositories. Sometimes we uh, implement uh, tools through repositories. I checked all these and they have IPv6 support. This is the dual link. We use Debian and there I put the files of the repositories. I even here put the commands for these are the commands to install the Joule tool. They are there in the Joule website, but I put it here. It's very simple. It's just downloading, decompressing, and installing. And remember the time in the relay. So the IP6 address, uh, IP6 address at for add. Um, I route add default to the such as the route to the clients. I uh, activate the routing. Very important that in Linux, if you're not using handling servers, please no, um, uh, avoid having IPs that you don't need and disable the temporal IP. Sometimes when there are A's in uh, the network, then uh, now, so this, the dual tool that is used for SIT data centers is called Joule SIT. It, it loads the module, it activates the VLANs, and basically the command that you have to run is you create an instance, in this case we call it Blacknet35, there basically you are creating a table and you add the entries. The command is the Joule SIT, you put the table and you say, I want you to map this uh, slash 122 with this uh, slash 32 and this 96, etc. So basically everything we said is solved with these commands. Of course, everything needs to be installed, routed and defined. Remember, I can map all IPv4 in IPv6, but I can't map IPv6 in IPv4 for just one part. That's what it says in this comment in the green box. The table will remain like this. So we're going to see it work. So now let me see it here. Here I have Jose. Please be very brief. We are all interested in the demo, but please be brief. Oh, just a minute, just a minute. This is the table. And now, and this is the client. Notice that the client, I can ping I can pin it, I can put the prefix, I, I put an IPv4 address, I'm translating it manually, not with DNS, and notice that now I'm pinging it in that uh, uh, IP address. And the interesting thing is that I can do that from IP, but I can also ping from, if you look, ping this IP. If I do ping here, this IPv4 ping technically is being solved by an IPv6 through the translator. So this is what I had to share with you today. There you have my contact details, and I'd like to invite you to access the networking room of the LACNIC meeting. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Thank you very much, LACNIC, for allowing me to make this presentation today. I'm happy to take any questions. Have a great day. Thank you, Jose. Thank you very much. Everything was great, excellent. I was now coming to the end of the course, and I was wondering if we can support people in saving IPv4 address and particularly with the deployment of IPv6. Now, surprisingly enough, there are no questions in the Q&A box. There was one person that had raised their hand and I would like to give the floor. That person raised their hand quite some time ago, Hernan and Roberto. You have the floor. Hernani. Hernani. Please go ahead with your question. Okay, yo, yo creo que fue, tenía la, la, I think la he had raised his hand even right at the beginning of the presentation. Okay, Douglas Fisher, your question, Douglas. Yes, we can hear you. 
I'm going to ask my question in Portuguese, please. Sim. Esse mecanismo ele faz o mapeamento hexadecimal na base binária. Is on a binary basis. Sometimes the memorization of the case of mnemonics. Is there a marking mechanism as having the decimal of the IP in the 16 bits of IPv6? For example, H colon colon. I don't know if I made myself clear. Ah, the translation, yes, that precisely, yes, exactly. Not with a point, but with a colon. Yes, that exactly. No. Like that? No, no, no. Using the points after each decimal point instead of the point colon. Well, you can do your translation manually and you can put the end of the IPv6 version, which is an IPv4. You can use it in IPv4 format, which is based 256, but you can also write it translated 0808 colon 0808. You can write this last part, which is IPv4, expressed in a different format. So the interesting thing about this is that both Linux and Windows and the modern OSs to date, do, this is called text representation of an IPv6, which has an IPv4 embedded. The OSs already allow you to do this, both at programming level and what the recommendation is to use domain name. But you can use this uh, whichever IPv4 or IPv6, which is embedded. This is allowed and Linux recognizes this and Windows recognizes it too. There's no problem with that. You can use it either way. I think I understood your question. Yes, was it whether you could use this one way or the other? But is there a more automated way, for example, separating the decimals. But I'm going to study this a bit. It was very interesting. Well, what I can tell you is that the operating systems allow you to do these two types of representation, full IPv6 or text IPv6, which is an IPv4, which any other option is absolutely welcome. And you can add this through a script or some kind of function within the application that you are doing or within your OS. All those things are going to come because I traffic IPv4 to IPv6 or IPv6 to IPv4 is going to happen. And I hope, well, I hope this answered your question. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Douglas, for your question. Jose, we have two questions in the q and I'm going to read them out to you. These are the last two questions we're going to read out. And please be brief with your answers. One question is from Emerson Arredondo. He said, good day. How can we encapsulate IPv6 traffic on an IPv4 VPN tunnel when I only have an IPv6 in an extreme? Well, that's a good question. We have to say, like Alejandro Costa mentioned, there are transition mechanisms based on dual stack and encapsulation and on translation. You're speaking about using encapsulation. In the case of encapsulation, there are many protocols. There are several options, six to four, and so on. And there are some mechanisms that do encapsulation six to four or four to six. If you're doing six over IPv4 encapsulation, I would suggest using SIIT. Microtik has uh, this interface here, six to four. This allows two devices which are IPv4 
can do encapsulation of an IPv6. This would be I SIIT or 624, and also with VPN and even IP, IP, and on that you have a gray, and then on that you put an IPv6. But I would start using the SIT. Jose. Thank you, Jose. And the last question from Luis Rengifo. A question, is this mechanism, mechanism done in the operator or should be done in the devices of the company? Is it possible to ask the ISP to do so? Well, that's a good question because it allows me to remind you that the concept of these mechanisms is that for the clients, for the users, or in this case, for the data centers, the mechanism is transparent. We don't have to do anything on the customer side. The translations at the data centers are done in the operator's network. If it's six to six, or it goes to four, but the translations have to be done as part of the operator's network. You can do this on the client side, but the client should know what you're doing. The client could request this, if this is considered as a service provided by the SP to do this for a given prefix. But this concise answer is that this is part of the job of the ISP. Thank you. Jose, please do not leave. We have already finished with the course, but we're going to have a game now with three prizes. Before going over to the game, let me remind you that we have the networking room. We have the Discord, which is the app you can use that we sent to all the participants. We also included it in the Q&A box. Remember that there are mechanisms that allow you to reach the members of the panel and all the participants. The idea is to do networking during the event. So please take the opportunity to meet Alejandro. Just give me a couple of seconds. I see there's a final, final question. The issue of my firewall and security. If an IPv6 for, has IPv4 traffic, all the IPv4 traffic will have an IPv6 traffic. So at firewall level, you have to take into account the prefixes because you're going to include this and then have to include the IPv4. The other question is that in the case of Linux, this can be integrated with IPv6 tables and you can play around with the firewall. So thank you, Alejandro, and sorry for adding that at the end.